We're talking NASCAR, race number 30 in 2024. It's Kansas for a second time. And if it's anything like what took place in May earlier this year, we're in for a good one. Thanks for tuning in here. Prime Sports Network, CJ Verduna, Rotowire. Joining me as always. And it's all NASCAR for the next, what, three or four weeks before uh, F1 returns? Yeah, I think we had a two-week break or three-week break here before uh, the Formula One circus heads to the Western Hemisphere for the, their last six races or so. So all NASCAR here, all, all for the playoffs. And if you did fail to jump the gun, or maybe you didn't have the money and you, 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 you just weren't sure about our, uh, our, our, our advice to take Max Verstappen to win the championship at minus, what was he, 215 last week, something like that? He was over 200, yep, minus so Even though he didn't win... And Leonard Norris won. The guy that the driver who is the closest and the only driver who could beat him. Uh, the fact is, it was still it, it worked out for Max, uh, and yet the odds dropped. Uh, so now you could still get Max at minus one sixty five to win the championship with only six races to go. And Leonard Norris basically he's got to win all six races, and if he doesn't, then he needs Max Verstappen to like DNF a couple of times. Yeah, we got uh, six races left, a handful of sprint races. Um, Max Verstappen continues to score points at every race, despite the fact that Lando Norris and McLaren are, are clearly the better car right now. We anticipated Verstappen and Red Bull not performing well at Singapore. He still managed to finish second. I think that bodes well for the races that are yet to come because that car is better at those tracks. So he's going to be scoring points. So effectively, second in the future is Lando Norris needs absolutely has to have, I should say, for stop and not finish some races and run into some pretty big trouble. The only way that, that's the only way that he wins a championship. Otherwise, it's going to be Max Verstappen's as long as he keeps doing what he's doing. And if Max wins one more race, it's over, right? Yeah, basically. He's basically. got a 52-point 50, lead. You can get a maximum of 26 points, 25 points, really. 26 if you get the fastest lap, too. Daniel Ricciardo got the fastest lap last week at Singapore, though. So it's a little bit more difficult to count on that one extra point. But you got a margin of 52 points with only six chances really left to do it. So we're stopping. Like I said, he's going to continue finishing. He's going to continue scoring points. Uh, the higher up the order, the harder it's going to he finishes, the harder it's going to be for Lando Norris to walk away. Lando Norris, as I said, absolutely has to have some bad luck happen for Max Verstappen not finish those races in order to have Norris win that driver's title. Well, it's just, again, you're, you're even in a better position you were last week, even though uh, it, it, it worked out uh, to, or at least some people would think, to Lando Norris's advantage, but I, I just don't see that as the deal. I'd rather go with minus 165 and take what happened last week. So there you go. You got minus 165 now if you want to go with Max Verstappen. We'll be talking F1 in a few weeks, uh, including Max Verstappen's naughty language. We'll be talking about that too uh, in, uh, in a few weeks. Uh, but speaking of futures, so uh, one round is in the books, in the playoffs in 2024. And so we look at the final 12 drivers uh, who have a chance to win the championship. And, uh, and it, look, this is interesting because Kyle Larson, see, this is another thing that you need to always keep in mind, put it up here for next year and in the future when it comes to wagering on f championship futures. When you're thinking about taking, you know, the top drivers, because Kyle Larson and Christopher Bell and these guys have been four to one. I mean, Kyle Larson's been four to one for about three months, maybe the whole year he's been four to one. So why would you risk it to have money not in your hands to do with what you want uh, and then just say, hey, you know what, I'll just do it now at 4-1. to one. I'm still getting 4-1 to because something could have happened. Carl Larson could have started the race last week and, 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 and wrecked it to the first lap and it would have been knocked out of the playoffs entirely. So, yeah, this is just a lesson. Um, the old days when a one driver dominated, it was so much better and he had eight, 10 wins in a year. I mean, it just seems like that those days are over. Which is great. That's the whole idea with the new next gen. So I just don't think that's the way to go anymore. So there you go. Bell is right there at four to one. Reddick five to one. Blaney six. Denny Hamlin. See, this is another thing because Hamlin was down at like four to one for most of the season, and, now, and so 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 another reason why you just wait because now you're getting better odds with Denny if you want to take him at six to one. Uh, you got Byron at eight. 
And that's about, you know, that's about where Byron's been all year, too. Same thing with Elliott. Uh, Logano, we told you to go with him uh, about a month or two ago when he was what? He was like in the 20s, wasn't he? Like 18 to 24 yeah. to 1 or something like that? He was 18, if not 20. Yep. Uh, and there you got Bowman, who's still a good bargain. Uh, it's These three, uh, I, I still, I got to agree with you. I think out of, out of these last four long shots, uh, besides Bowman, I, I still think Briscoe, why not, right? I mean, at this point, yeah, he's driving the best he ever has. Uh, it was he snuck his way into the playoffs. He he did well in this first round and able to move forward. And by the way, this second round of elimination races uh, features a super speedway and a road course again. So uh, Kansas this week is really the only outlier. Otherwise, I'm predicting something similar to the first round. Oh, okay. So last week. Uh, I, I, you know, I. Well, what, 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 what did you think? Because I think that <laughs> when, see, the, I said this on the on the Saturday it's show. Was that I said this on the. It was not. <laughs> I said this on the Friday show that, this is the old Bristol. I mean, this is the new new Bristol with with the next gen, that. If you if if you really just have a car that is is just got it then it could be a boring race and we saw that earlier this year with Hamlin and then we see it again with Larson and that's just yeah. a shame because it's the one bad thing about the next gen it's kind of taken away from what they do at Bristol and hopefully they can figure out a way to manipulate the tires to do something to get the, that track back to the way it was because it's just you know, there's just nothing going on. Even in a short track like Bristol, if you're just faster than everyone else, you can't get close enough to make it interesting. You can't get on his, can't get on his bumper. It so. was definitely not the normal Bristol. Uh, it, it, not the, not certainly not the Bristol that we like either. I, I don't. I've never in my life uh, seen Bristol dominated the way that Kyle Larson did Saturday night. 462 laps led out of 500. Uh, like you said, just he smoked the field. Um, Hamlin had the car that was, had the best setup back in the spring, despite the fact that we had the tire issues. Uh, maybe some of the guys that, that had the early tire issues would have been the ones that would have been able to challenge Hamlin. Uh, but he, he had the right setup. He had the right setup for those tires. He had the right setup for that track, and he ultimately dominated that day as well. I just hope that this isn't the new trend for Bristol. I hope that something, like you said, gen probably going to be with the tires. Um, not having them explode, but it, at least having them wear down faster. I think that's going to be the solution. They need to figure it out fast um, because that was not uh, the most entertaining Bristol race I've ever seen. No. All right. So uh, we're going to Candace again, and this is good news again uh, based on what we saw in May. Uh, it was one of, if not the, the most exciting race of the year, uh, especially the way that it ended. Um, I watched the replay again a little while ago just to refresh my myself, and definitely looked like Chris Buescher uh, made a bad decision with Larson. I think that he could have moved up and blocked them even more up at the high line. Didn't do that. Allowed Larson to go around him and, and, and go wire to wire, basically, and then they hit. And then it also looked like this was the first time ever that they, uh, you know, they looked at the, uh, well, it wasn't official official, but that it looked like Busher had won. Busher's name was first, and they were all celebrating. And then, lo and behold, they had to look at it again. And, and I guess, I, I don't know if it was because that. So what's that thing that comes out of the car, which, which was the determination and on the fact that Larson won? The transponder. Yeah, it was oh, so the that's electric, what it is. Okay. electric signal or the radio signal crossing the line because the way that the angle of the finish line camera had it, like you said, it made it look like Busher was ahead, but the transponder in uh, Larson's car, actually from a um, timing perspective, had, had Larson ahead, and so therefore Larson won. And I, I remember talking with you after this race, the week after, about how placement of the transponder in the car, obviously NASCAR dictates exactly where it gets placed, but something like that when you're down to a thousandth of a second <laughs> between the two um just a little bit a fraction of an inch 
have a different placement of where that transponder was in each car uh, could have made the difference. But obviously, there are rules about that, and there's uh, that's why they have all these very precise measurements and why they're very strict, obviously, in inspection. So closest race in NASCAR Sprint Cup history. Uh, it was a good one, and I agree with you. I think it was um, Busher that kind of opened the door to allow Larson to get that run that ultimately grabbed him right at the end. Well, even though we may never have a race that is won by one driver over another that close, what that tells me is is that at some point, there's no reason to not believe that we're going to have a dead heat. Absolutely. So that'll be really interesting whenever that happens. So Yeah. Okay. This one almost was. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess as close as, as you can uh, get to without it happening. All right, so that's what happened in that one. And it was a real good race uh, that looked like Denny Hamlin was going to win, by the way. This is one of those races where uh, it happens, uh, you know, a dozen times a year where a driver looks like he's going to win and there's less than 10 laps to go and a caution comes out and he loses. And this is what happened to Denny. He led the race. He led uh, by a little, almost a second over Martin Truex. And, uh, and, 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 and this was maybe, I don't know if this was actually the beginning of the end for Truex. I guess I'd have to look at the, let me see if I could see any, uh, where, 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 where it really started to fall for Truex was right. Oh, actually it was. That is great. Wow, what a great job by me. <laughs> that was the beginning of the end for, for Martin Truex. That was his last top five. So what I mean by the beginning of the end, though, is is he he had a little bit of a shot. It was seven laps to go. It's possible he would have caught Hamlin. Possible. And then he goes into the pits, and they decide four tires. Everyone else takes two. And he comes out of the pits in tenth and can only get to fourth. That right there was the beginning of the end. For Martin, so he never had it better. He never had a chance any better than that. And uh, lo and behold, uh, that would be the high point uh, just before the caution when it because he was about to maybe catch Hamlin. That was the high point. As soon as that caution came out, Kyle Busch uh, lost control and the caution came out. The low point started uh, for Martin Truex Jr. Uh, anyway, Kyle Busch was fourth when he spun out, and Chris Busch, of course, uh, not. Uh, being able to get it done by this much and uh, it was also Denny Hamlin that as you can tell the reason why he might have been, uh, been caught his car just wasn't uh, even though it changed tires and all that his car just wasn't as good as uh, maybe Busher and uh, Larson there at the end so uh, we're going to go obviously all into this and and that's, a, that's a, by the way a really good point to just remind everybody that you can take two tires at Kansas and win a race and that's a good thing so the most similar track we're going to be talking about, there's only one, as far as I'm concerned, that's Vegas. Do you agree? I would totally agree with you on that one. Okay. So it'll be Vegas as the most similar. They're both 1.5-mile triovals, and they're, they're the most similar. Now, who would have thought this? It's not a short track, but for a 1.5-mile trioval, 28 of 37 all-time winners at Kansas Speedway started in the top 12, and that is the first six rows. So uh, that percentage, let's see, is, oh, wait a second, what is it, 37 divided by 28 is, uh, is that what it is? 75%. So 75% of the time, the winner is in the top 12, starts in the top 12. Uh, the nine that did not start in the top 12 include uh, 21st, 23rd, and 25th. So that's a, uh, I know it's only been 37 races, CJ, but 25th as the farthest back to win at Kansas seems uh, a little unusual. That was Brad Kozlowski back in 2011. Surprised by that? A little bit, actually. I'm surprised um, that we had kind of two in a row right then in 2011. So Keselowski won from 25th. Later that year, Jimmy Johnson won from 19th. And I was looking at the Xfinity Series races as well as the Truck Series races at this track over the same time. And trucks have been there 20 some times, I want to say. And the furthest anyone has started back and won uh, was actually earlier this year when Corey Heim won from 13th. Uh, 24 races from the Xfinity Series, the farthest anyone has started 
uh, back in one was 19th, and that was Denny Hamlin, and then Joe Nemechek also did that uh, back in like 2004 or so. Uh, so yeah, this track is very much a track position track. It's a 1.5 mile oval. There are different grooves, so the guys can move around depending upon how their car handles. As you said, you can do a two tire stop with the rules of the way that they are now with the, the car and, and the setups and all that good stuff, which provides for good racing. But I still think at the end of the day, like most of the 1.5 mile ovals, it's about speed and it's about horsepower and it's about being able to translate that all the way through the corner. And kind of like we had at Bristol, if you've got the right setup early, you have the chance to be able to pull away through long green flag runs on 1.5 mile ovals. And I think that's exactly what uh, this track has produced in its history. All right, and some other important trends. Keep in mind that 18 of the 37, so that's uh, right around 50%, started uh, in the top five with seven poles. How about that? Seven poles, 18, 50% of the top five. That's pretty high as well. Now, as far as the manufacturers, Toyota's won seven of the last 10. So, boom, you've got, we've got, a, we've got a, a manufacturer that we're, we're, we're zeroing in on. Even though we're going to put, even though Chevy is still okay because of the fact that, hey, look, Larson just won the race. And um, even though it's only two wins of the last 11. But the one manufacturer that we really are not going to be looking at this week is Ford because they have not had a win in the last seven, just one in the last 10. That was Joey Logano in 2020. So I think that's really the way to look at it. If, if we want to give an edge, we're definitely going to give it to Toyota. Um, but Chevy is, is, is kind of right behind, not too far back. Ford, look, if you, if you get a good number and, 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 and uh, it, you know, you, you got a driver that you're, you're willing to take a chance on, like maybe Joey Logano will get into, then, okay, may, maybe you got one long shot in there, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do more than that for Ford. Yeah, I would agree, but don't forget that Chris Buescher drives a Ford, and he almost won. Uh, that go. would have that would have changed that intro dramatically. I think it's also important to note we talked about starting position. Um, it, this includes obviously more than just the next generation car, but or the new generation car. But since 2020, no one has started lower than 10th and one, and most of them have been inside the top five, as you said. So definitely yeah, so folks in after the qualifying show for those in the top 10, certainly those in the top five. Yeah. So there you go. So that's the thing is if you do get a Ford that is qualifying uh, up front somewhere and you're still getting halfway decent odds, then go for it. Okay, so let's get right into it. And we are going to start with uh, the big surprise up front, and that is Kyle Larson and Denny Hamlin, as well they should be. But the problem is they're only three and four to one. And... uh, Look, I, I, look, Larson won last week, so here we go again. This is this is we haven't seen one all year. The, the, the back-to-back winner, so this is the reason we stay away from it. Doesn't mean Larson can't do that this week, but when you stay away from it all the time, and like we have all year, we haven't gotten bitten all year, and maybe we get bitten once. Could happen. Maybe this maybe this setup's perfect for Larson because it is. Um, but and I tell you right now, I'd still, I, I'd still probably take Larson. I'd probably go with Larson over Hamlin, even though he won last week, because we're in a different round. So it's it, it, there's a little difference to that. There's like a recharge of, of of not thinking. Well, I won last week, and no, it's like, hey, I, I got to do good this week. It's who cares about last week? That's the mindset. Okay, but look at Larson. Uh, he has two wins since 21. And six straight top tens, five of those top fives, two runner-ups and two wins out of those top fives. And then throw in the fact that, again, he won this year. Um, uh, and he also won at Vegas, which is the real clincher. So he, he, he led, as a matter of fact, 181 of 267 in the dominating win at Vegas. So he's got the wins in both of the tracks that we're talking about. As a matter of fact, he's won the last two at Vegas. Uh, so maybe he'll win the, ne- the next two at Kansas. I could, that could definitely happen, uh, but one one key is that when, when we're talking about all of those top tens, that well those six straight top tens, all of them he started in the top seven. So make sure you keep an eye on that. I'll remind you on Saturday if Kyle Larson does not have a good qualifying run, and I don't I don't see any reason why he won't. But if he doesn't, 
then I'm probably going to avoid them, especially because I don't think the odds are going to change any. What could they change to? Yeah, I, I um, you know, if there was any week at any track that we might see the first repeat winner uh, back to back and then also sweeping the track, so that's two that's going against Larson. Um, I do think, unfortunately, that Kyle Larson is the one to do it. But like you said, there's no reason to take him now. There's absolutely no incentive to take him early. Wait until you see where he qualifies. If he qualifies in the top five, absolutely, by all means, I think he's got a good shot. Uh, but if he slips up in qualifying, avoid him like the plague. Um, moving on to, to Denny Hamlin, he's a little bit different of a story. Um, I'm still not going to go for Denny Hamlin because based on how he's driving right now, his results haven't been great. Bristol was a yep. great track for spring. It was not a good track for him Saturday. He barely made an impression. Uh, this track tends to be quite good for him, regardless of where he starts. He finished second and fifth in the last two races here, fifth earlier this year, and he started 14th in both of those. He finished second when he started 25th back in the fall of 2022. He's finished fourth when he started 18th uh, in the spring of 2022. So I think Hamlin very much makes your fantasy roster this week. I'm not so sure that I would take an early bet on him at uh, four to one right now. Again, maybe wait to see how he qualifies. If he's really super fast in qualifying, maybe I'll reconsider. But even if he qualifies inside the top 10, just based on his past couple races here, the, the streak that he's on, uh, I just don't think he's the same Demi, Denny Hamlin that we were seeing earlier this year where he was co-favorite pretty much every week. And unlike Larson, Hamlin does not need to qualify well. So what you're hoping for, if you want Hamlin or you like him this week, you wait for qualifying and you hope that he qualifies somewhere around 10th or 15th. Uh, maybe that'll help you out with the odds. So at least it doesn't shrink any. Because uh, if Larson finishes, qualifies in the top three or four, his odds could drop, believe it or not, a little bit. Uh, but it's still worth waiting. Uh, and for Hamlin, absolutely worth waiting uh, because uh, you might even be getting better than four to one if he doesn't qualify in the top 10. And again, uh, I think that that doesn't mean anything. I still think that uh, if you like Hamlin, bottom line, I'm not saying I would, but if you like Hamlin, then still like him if he qualifies uh, 15th or 12th or whatever. Okay, so now we got a gap to Reddick, Bell, Elliott. All right, so um, and so, is this worth uh, saying no to Larson and Hamlin and then going with the next guy as well? Reddick's a defending champ, plus he was second at Vegas this year. Okay, so that's good. But he was 20th at Vegas this year. I mean, 20th at Kansas this year. So nothing, nothing not so good. Um, and, he, and, and the thing I'm a little bit concerned with is he seems to be cooling off a little bit. So we, and, and, and this is what happens. You know, we, we talk about it all the time. You know, you get hot, and did you get hot too soon? All that other stuff, and it's kind of cooled off a little bit. Um, so any seven to one. Then you got Elliot and Bell, and then Elliot uh, has a win back in 2018, an average of 10.2 career over 17 races. He was third earlier this year, uh, 12th at Vegas, and you have Bell. Sixth this year, really bad issue at Vegas. Has an Xfinity win here, but has never won here in the Cup Series, even though he has three poles in his last five, including two straight. Now, here's the problem is that those odds are going to drop if he has another pole. So, would you take him now? See, I'm going to pass on Bell, even though if you want to take him, there are reasons to like him. Based on what I just said, you know, being fast here with three poles and all in the last five is good. And he does have an Xfinity win. Um, but the reason that I kind of don't like him is 11-1 is good. Don't get me wrong. I think that's solid. But the only reason that I kind of might pass on him and I might take Elliott over Bell is because of the fact that I want more from Bell for, for a driver that has three poles in the last five. I don't want just 72 laps led. Th to me, that means that, well, he's really fast in these short increments, but for the long haul, he, he's not fast enough. Um, and I just also don't also like the fact that at these two races this year, he hasn't really done much. So that's all. But 
again, I think I, I'm definitely open to anybody who likes them. Yeah, I like uh, certainly of the guys that are um, not named Larson and Hamlin. I think Bell and Elliott are probably your two best bets. Uh, I would probably go for Bell. And the reason I say that is because he's in a Toyota. And we know that Toyota performed here really, really well in the spring. And by the way, those were his teammates, Toyotas, that performed really well here in the spring. <clears throat> Obviously, he did two with consecutive poles, uh, finishing eighth and sixth. That's not terrible, but I agree. I would like to see him lead more laps, but I think that number at 11 to 1, uh, certainly if he goes out and qualifies on pole again, it's it's not going to be 11 to 1 anymore. Uh, Chase Elliott, again, very similar to last week. He's very consistent and consistently good at this track. He's a top 10 machine, finished uh, sixth and third in his last two races here, started fourth and ninth in those, led 47 laps in the fall race here last year. Uh, the reason I like Elliott, um, I was going to say earlier, I think maybe uh, with Larson at uh, such low odds and the potential to drop, you might want to look for the same reason that his teammates that are good at this track because they're in similar equipment, can borrow his notebook a little bit and might be able to step up their game. And that means Chase Elliott, William Byron, and Alex Bowman all come into play. And certainly of that bunch, I think uh, Chase Elliott deserves the look. Started ninth, finished third here earlier this year. He's been relatively quiet but also relatively consistent in those top finishes as well. So uh, I would give the edge over these two just slightly to Bell, only because he's in the Toyota. And the Toyota teammates of his were the stronger cars, I think, uh, earlier this year. Uh, whereas Elliot, he's the teammate of the guy that won the race. So, I mean, it, we're splitting hairs. I think either one's a good choice. Um, flip a coin. I think either one's a good one to go with. Well, I mean, your strategy uh, could just be then is, you know what, I'm just going to take, I can get, Bell and Elliot yep. against Larson, <laughs> and I'm in a good situation because I'm getting eleven to one on both of them compared to three to one on Larson. So I'm okay with that. I got no problem with that one. All right. So now we go to we've got Blaney, we've got Truex, uh, we got Byron at fourteen, and also Kyle at fourteen. Okay, so. As far as this group is concerned, none of them really jump out. Matter of fact, I'm just going to pass on Byron and Truex. Everybody knows why we're passing on Truex. I mean, they've known that for... I was going to say, do we have to talk about Truex yeah. at this point? And, 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 the, and the crazy thing is, if, you just, if you're just opening your eyes to this race and they've not watched anything the last several months, you'd go, oh, Truex, 12-1, to 1, I like him. Look, he almost won earlier this year, 13 top 10s in his last 15 in Kansas, seven top fives and one are up at two wins and blah, 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 blah. No, it's just not working out for Martin Truex Jr. Uh, it's not to say that one of these races, it, it can't happen, but it, and it can, uh, but not on my money. And we've been right to, 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 to stay away for all this time right now, so why would we change? Uh, but yeah, Byron hasn't shown much here. And it's also uh, it kind of is you know not gotten up to the playoff start that we thought he could. Uh, just one top five at his last eight on the season. Uh, Blaney and Bush. Now Blaney, I only want Blaney if I'm getting a little bit better odds than twelve to one. I mean he's driving a Ford. Now maybe because of what Busher did, there's hope, and we know Ryan Blaney is capable of uh, putting it together at some place that he hasn't done well before because he has been getting better at some of those uh, tracks. Um, but keep in mind, he got off to a good start in his career here with three top fives in his first six appearances. Hasn't had a top five since. Uh, so, um, But he was third at Vegas, 12th earlier this year. That's okay. Not that It's not that bad. I just think I want a little bit more than 12 to 1 because of it. I don't know if I'm going to get that. And then Kyle, uh, yeah, I mean, Kyle, I just wonder whether or not he's, he's also cooling off like Redick over his last two races. So that's a little bit of an issue. But I am getting 14 to 1. And he's, a, he's been a much better driver here in the second half of his career, as we remember. This used to be his nemesis track early on. But he, he changed that, and he's been really solid here. Problem is, 26th at Vegas, no wins at Vegas since 2009, eighth earlier this year, just one win since 2016 here. And he's not having the greatest year, and it's only 14-1. to 1. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'd still look at Blaney and, and Bush. Uh and if I was looking at someone in that area, um, I don't know. I'd probably just go with Blaney, even though he's driving a Ford. 
Yeah, I think I agree. Um, you know, I'd like to put a little bit more on William Byron because I think as the playoffs go on, he has a tendency to to ramp it up. But like you said, we haven't seen it from him yet. Also at this track, uh, he qualifies really well. His average start is 12.5. He started on the pole uh, in the spring race last year. He's led 136 laps, but never won. Uh, but he finished 15th and 23rd in the two races, um, the latest two races here at Kansas. So nothing really overly inspiring there. Kyle Busch, um, started 35th in this race last year and walked his way all the way up to finish seventh and then finished eighth uh, earlier this year. So, you know, certainly the, the coin falls between Blaney and Bush. I think that Blaney's got a little bit more motivation uh, being where he is in the playoffs and it coming down to the wire. We know that Blaney can also rise to the occasions and get things done at places, like you said, that he hasn't traditionally gotten it done at. Back-to-back 12th -back place finishes from here, nothing terribly inspiring. Uh, like you, I, I think the odds should be a little bit more generous given that, uh, but they are what they are. So out of this bunch, probably I would go with Blaney, uh, maybe Bush, maybe Byron, if Byron were showing a little bit more. But again, for all of them, I'd just wait and see what they do in qualifying. Yeah, uh, and because you have Hamlin and Reddick and Larson up there, you, you you should you should be okay. Where even if you do well in qualifying, when you're back here, you you shouldn't lose too many points. You lose a little bit. Like Byron might go from fourteen to eight to one if he's on the pole, but he's not going to go much further than that because of those other drivers ahead of him. With the odds being at the way, so that's, that 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 helps out a little bit. And yeah, keep in mind as we just said, we're talking about Kyle. He's fourth this year when he spun out. So yeah, I guess one thing I would throw in though as well, uh, this is not for betting because I would avoid Truex at all costs on on the betting front because I just don't think that he has it. Uh, but if you have if you want to swing for the fences a little bit, maybe in fantasy land, if you're putting together a fantasy roster. Maybe Martin Truex is one that you make your more risky selection with because he does have good history here. He has the teammates that have performed performed well earlier this year. He performed well earlier this year. He doesn't have the pressure of the playoffs anymore. He's just racing for wins in his last full-time season. So maybe that pressure comes off a little bit. It might take a little bit of time for that to settle in after getting eliminated next week. But I wouldn't shy away necessarily from Truex in a more risky lineup in a fantasy format. Busher who nearly won is getting 18 to one. Now remember well, for everybody that we talked about, uh, if you got Busher here for 18 now, what was that? Why would you go for any of that group that we talked about? <laughs> yeah. For 18 right yes, now. <laughs> absolutely. And the thing is, and, and look, maybe all of those trends that we were going over, cause we, we, we say this all the time, a new year's a new year. You never know what's going to happen in the new year. Even if it's even if it's not happening at the other track, because I was looking at Vegas and keep this in mind that uh, Las Vegas uh, Ford has just one win there in the last eight races. So um, and 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 uh, what was it? Larson winning earlier this year, but it's possible that maybe Ford is start. Maybe this is the defining moment when Ford starts catching up at Kansas. How do we know? Maybe five years from now, that's when we start seeing the change. And Ford all of a sudden is doing well. So those things happen. They change all the time. And uh, and, and, and he's got to take advantage of it. So he's 18-1. to 1. Uh, He just went a little while ago at Watkins Glen. Uh, his teammate's 22-1 to 1 Kozlowski. And now that Kozlowski's out of it and he did nothing in the playoffs, I see no reason to go with him here. So he's off the board. Wallace has a win here. So you always have to think about that. Um, and that was in 2022, but he's done nothing in both races this year. Gibbs is, is, is just proof once again that we can talk about Xfinity and it, and it does make a difference it just as a part of when you're handicapping. But don't go by that as like some golden rule because Gibbs is two races in the Xfinity Series, first and third. And now in the Cup Series, he's never done anything better than 14th. Three of his races were in the 30s. He's never led a lap. So this has not been a good race track for, for Gibbs in the NASCAR series. He was fifth at Vegas. The only good thing is you get 20 to 1. But out of this group, uh, it, it's the two Fords. It's uh, Busher and it's Logano because Logano's getting 22 to 1. He's a three-time winner. Yeah, he didn't look good earlier this year, but he just got in a whole bunch of messes. Ninth at Vegas is just okay. 
has only led 10 laps in the last five races combined. But again, if Chris Buescher can do it in a Ford, I see no reason to think that Joey Logano and Ryan Blaney can't figure it out. So, um, yeah. So, again, I, I would definitely look at Buescher and Logano. And Buescher has to be the best, uh, you know, top in a long shot so far that we've talked about. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, Buescher at 18-1, to considering he very nearly won in the spring and has been racing extremely well this year, actually the past couple of seasons, I think he can get it done in a Ford. I think Bubba Wallace is definitely one to consider. A um, little more up and down, a little bit more unpredictable. You're getting some um, uh, profit in the odds as a result of that, though. <clears throat> Wallace also just got a contract extension, and the contract extension was with the caveat that he has to improve. That obviously starts now for him, so he's got to keep uh, stepping forward. This is a track probably that is really good for him to take that pressure on because he's got the past win here, so he's got some confidence. Ty Gibbs finally getting some odds here that are reflective of what he's actually been delivering on track and a little bit more realistic. I still think it should be lower, though, especially considering this hasn't been a good track for him. But then Joey Logano, I think, is um, almost, uh, uh, you know, as good as a, a busher choice. Uh, finished sixth and fifth before finishing 34th here earlier this year. And like you said, and like we've been talking about all year, it seems like every other week Logano has some kind of bad issue, whatever that may be, uh, goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, this is a place where he's got the three wins at. You're getting 22. Uh, yeah, he's in the Ford, but uh, he won um, uh, already in the playoffs, and I think he can do it again. So Joey Logano and Chris Buescher out of that bunch. Yeah, Logano kicked off the playoffs with a win, and so he's going to look to kick off the second round with a win as well. All right, and then we go to the super long shots. Uh, you got Chastain again, cross him out. Uh, but out of this group here, the ones that are interesting would be Briscoe Bowman and Gregson. Like, he's probably not going to win a race like this. Uh, his best chance at this stage of his career might be at a super speedway, maybe next week. But he does have, Gregson does have some uh, good. Uh, his, you know, some nice history here considering he won the Xfinity race in 2022. I think it was his last Xfinity race um, that uh, that he uh, raced at Kansas. Um, and he was sixth at Las Vegas and ninth here, starting third. So those are the three nice things to say about Noah Gregson at 70 to 1. But as far as Briscoe and Bowman, the big difference would be if you want to stick with the four deal, then you're going to say Bowman. Um, especially because Briscoe has never had a top 10 and never led a lot. But as we mentioned at the, at the outset, he's really racing well, wins Darlington, goes to the playoffs, has that early accident in Atlanta when anything can happen in Atlanta, comes back with an eighth and a sixth. Uh, he also has a win here in Xfinity Series. So he has had success here before, even though it hasn't happened yet, didn't happen earlier this year, didn't happen in Vegas. But you're getting 30 to 1 for it. Bowman... I'm a little bit more confident about because he was seventh this year. He did win Vegas in 2022, and he has 10 top 12s in his last 13 at Kansas with three top fives and a runner-up. Uh, matter of fact, he led 107 laps in this race in 2022, finished fourth, and starting the playoffs with two top 10s and one top five. So I'm definitely looking at putting a couple of long shot uh, bucks on Prisco and Bowman. Bowman being uh, the top one. I don't know, maybe I throw a buck on Gregson. Yeah, I think I agree with Gregson. Um, maybe worth a dollar, but at a 1.5 mile oval where it's all about speed, horsepower, the t bigger teams just tend to dominate. And, and therefore, I don't think that this is going to be his greatest chance. I do like him a lot um, the next week that we're going to be talking about. Uh, but certainly out of this bunch, I think Alex Bowman head and shoulders above i can't believe we're actually talking about him at 35 to 1 considering uh he hasn't finished lower than 11th at this track since the spring of 2021 so he's going on a three-year streak of basically top tens at this track finished seventh earlier this year there was um a fourth place finish in the fall of 2022 that he led over 100 laps he's a teammate to the guy that won here earlier this year um, so he's got a lot of things going his way. He's also got the momentum, or I guess not the momentum, but the hunger uh, of getting his playoff advancement out of the way early. Uh, so I think you have to go with Alex Bowman. He's a really good value right there. And then Chase Briscoe, I think you just have to ride the train. 
of momentum that he's on until it stops. He's he's racing extremely well right now. Like you said, this is a track where in prior series, coming up through the ladder system, he's had success. That's exactly what he did at Darlington. Uh, he's been impressing pretty much on any kind of format. So I think that uh, Briscoe and Bowman are definitely worth choosing. I would put a little bit more emphasis on Bowman though. And keep in mind, uh, the whole deal with Chastain just has to do with the fact that he's just it's just been a bad luck kind of year for Chastain overall, you know, he has been getting better results. Uh, I think he, I think I feel a lot better taking Chastain over Truex. If I was going that route, um, keep in mind, Chastain led 43 laps this year. Didn't, you know, finish well, but still led 43 laps in this race this year and finished fourth at Las Vegas this year. So, um, and, he, and again, result-wise, he's actually been doing okay, and you're getting 28 to 1. It's just, I, I just rather just stay away from both of those drivers like I have for the past couple of months and just keep doing it. Um, and, and if one of them wins, then one of them wins. Okay. Then the last ones. I think the only one to really uh, point out here as far as I'm concerned, or, or I mean, just a couple is to keep, keep you know, keep it uh keep it real regarding their how they're racing and, and how they've done here would be you've got uh jones finished third this year okay so there's that and he does have four top fives in his career at kansas uh Hosevar is is having the best time of his cup career over the last couple of months uh priest is actually believe it or not had back-to-back top tens i believe uh, which I'm not sure has ever happened. Uh, so out of uh, out of the, out of these last remaining long shots, and most of this is fantasy stuff. Uh, I, I I'd probably I'm just circling back. I I'd, I'd probably look at Sindrick because Sindrick, um, you know, he's he did crash earlier this year, but he started seventh. He's had solid runs in the playoffs. 13-10-10. He has two runner-ups and five Xfinity races, leading 283 combined laps, which is pretty impressive. He's never done anything in the Cup Series, but he is 70 to one. And you know, I I wonder if you're going up Gregson and Sindrick, who would you take Sindrick? Ah, uh, wow, that's tough. You know, Sindrick probably has like the playoff motivation so that's uh, a plus on his side he also finished uh, 11th and 12th those are his two best finishes here but he finished outside of the top 30 in the last three crashing like you said in the spring Noah Gregson a little bit probably uh, maybe a little bit more variable in terms of his opportunity I would say this week so Gregson could do either really well or really poorly Whereas I think Austin Sindrick, based on how he's been racing in the playoffs, I think is going to be a, a pretty consistent one. So I'd probably just give the edge very slightly to Sindrick. I think both are pretty good from a fantasy standpoint. The only other one I might throw into the conversation in general, you mentioned Jones, <clears throat> would be Austin Dillon. Um, not the greatest season. I started turning things around probably two months ago, maybe a month and a half ago. I had a run of top 15s for like six or seven races here before 33rd and 25th in the last two so he was getting the job done and has earlier in his career as well so if he can figure out what his past two races problems were here for himself i think he can return back to the top 15. Uh, so i think probably a cindric um you mentioned jones but dylan would probably be the only other one i'd throw into that conversation all right it's time uh to give our picks so what you going to do? What's the strategy? Are you going to bypass the two favorites? I'm going to bypass the two favorites, and I'm actually going to go Toyota because of their slight edge at the track and go with a Christopher Bell. Okay. So he's going to be your top choice. Who's going to be, be my, your next choice? My next choice, let's go with a Chevrolet, and let's go with a Hendrick. Um, actually, remind me where Elliot is again. He's at 11. All right, so it can't be Elliot. So well, I am going to do. I mean, you didn't do a favorite, so you could do Elliot if you want. No, I'll do. I'll, do uh, I'll take Bowman as my long shot, and I'll go ahead with. Um, let's go with. Uh, why not? Let's put Chris Chris Busher in that mid slot. Oh yeah, of course, that's definite. All right, 
uh, then you know what? Um, I will... I mean, obviously, I like all three of those picks. So I'll take three others. I'll go Chase at 11, Logano at 22, and Briscoe at 30. So Thank you for taking Briscoe. <laughs> you're welcome. Good choice. We're all, we've got them all. And again, I will talk more about uh, how these odds are shaping up on Saturday. So it's going to be a really important Saturday starting lineup show. I have no idea what time it's going to be. You know, I, I looked. Um, I don't see. I don't know why they don't have this information available on Tuesday. They should already know when they're going to be qualifying. I don't know why they don't put that out in the public. But uh, I'm just going to guess because normally at this time of year it's been like two o'clock for a Saturday race, a Sunday race. So if that holds true, the good news is is my post game show. My college football postgame show does not start until late, late on Saturday night because Penn State's got a 7, 7.30 game start time. So I'll be doing a postgame show live at about 11 o'clock at night. I love that. Uh, but as far as that uh, opens things up for me to talk about this NASCAR race, so I will definitely be on within the half hour, hour, once qualifying is set, following practice as well, and I'll be able to give you a much better idea because uh, we, we've got these trends to go on, and then we're going to stick with them. Uh, we'll see how the odds... We won't know the odds. It's the only thing, but we'll have an idea. We'll be able to guess about what these odds uh, will uh, potentially look like uh, when we take a look at practice and qualifying. So um, that's going to wrap it up. Again, Talladega next week, and then uh, another road course. What is that, the Roval? It is the Charlotte Roval, so two really good, um, somewhat, you know, wild card races um to end out the second round very similar in nature as i said before to the first round where you had atlanta uh, and watkins Glen. but um should be interesting couple of weeks i think everybody's going to be wanting to get it done or at least the top guys uh trying their best to get it done this week so they don't have to sweat out the next two weeks so check back with us right here on prime sports network on saturday for our start, starting lineup video and then we're back again Next week, by the way, we, 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 I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do the show next week or record the show next week uh, at the same time because it's moving day for me. So I move, which means that the next time you see me, you will, you will see a new studio behind me, a new and improved studio. So um, I'll still be working on it. So it probably won't be exactly the way I want it for a couple of weeks, but it'll be different. So, um, hey, if I can get everything moved in time, Hopefully we'll, uh, w you know, we will. Then uh, we'll be able to record everything as is, and, and, and you'll be able to check out this video uh, on Tuesday evening. But if you don't see it on Tuesday evening, you'll know that I wasn't able to put it together. And then CJ and I will put try to put this uh, this video together for Talladega, uh, either Wednesday or Thursday. So uh, that's it. I'll see you on Saturday for the starting lineup report. You'll check out also CJ's fantasy report at RotoWire.com. That's going to be linked in. Uh, to the video that I post uh, for the starting lineup report. Uh, otherwise, you know the video. You know you can use those links even on this video that you see today. You could check out the RotoWire. By the way, what do you have during the week at this time of year at RotoWire? I mean, is it all only for the reports at the end of the week, or do you ever have stuff during the week? Never really anything during the week. I usually try to get my race recaps up on Mondays. Uh, so typically that's the only midweek thing until uh, we start getting closer to practice and qualifying for the weekend races. I might have a trucks uh, one earlier, depending upon when they race. Like last week, they raced Thursday night. So I had that one up Wednesday. Uh, but aside from that, it's usually Thursday or Friday that the pre-race views, previews go up on RotoWire.com. So if you don't want to wait for the link, uh, which I will post on Saturday with this with the with the starting lineup video. Just check out uh, the link that I provide for you in this video, which will send you right to the page, and you'll know uh, when to access it uh, when the report is available on Friday. Usually Friday, right? That's what you said. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right, CJ. Thank you as always, and uh, thanks for our viewers. Let us know what's on your mind. Uh, leave a comment. Leave a question, and uh, don't forget subscribe, like, and share. We appreciate that all the time, always. And uh, enjoy the race.